Welcome back to the James Kennedy Podcast, you gorgeous bunch. What is going on? You had a good week? Mine was pretty much exactly as I described it on last week's episode, where I convinced myself that all I'd do is work and then actually spent the uh, whole of a working Wednesday down at the waterfalls. <laughs> and I finally realized that I've got this really strange problem with regards to my clothing and going out in the sunshine. Firstly, I don't have any sunshine clothing. All I've got is black jeans and hoodies and t-shirts. I don't own any sandals or shorts. And if I go out in the sunshine, I'm wearing set trainers and black jeans and black t-shirts. An easily solvable problem. I'm quite aware of that, but I have this kind of built-in resistance to wearing shorts and sandals. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's all the trauma I've collected over the years from sitting next to people on aeroplanes that, you know, barefoot and with their shorts and their big hairy, sweaty legs and feet next to me for like eight hours on a flight or something. I've kind of like convinced myself that nobody wants to see hairy legs and sweaty feet, you know what I mean? So I keep mine permanently covered up in vampire clothing. And if you want to know what I wore to the waterfalls to sunbathe and what I wore to the beach last week to sunbathe by the sea, you guessed it. Black jeans, trainers, and a black t-shirt. I'm fucking ridiculous. I know, man. You know, I've got a problem. I'm aware of it. I've learned that now. I am working on it. I'm trying to be a better person. I'm trying to be a better me. I just need your support and understanding while I go through this and emerge the other side, a better me, a happier me, a healthier me, a fully ventilated sandal having short wearing version of me. I know it's going to be a long journey, but I've committed to it just one sandal at a time. Um, this week, we also scattered my father's ashes. We've been meaning to do that for a while. I'm just trying to get everybody, you know, in the same place at the same time and pick a nice day to do it. My dad didn't want any kind of religiously orientated, traditional kind of funeral or anything like that. You know, my father was a passionate atheist and he explicitly said, I don't want any churches or blokes in ropes. <laughs> but what he did want was to have his ashes scattered by a tree that he chose in the local area that's next to a lake, a beautiful location. And it was a kind of a going back to nature kind of idea, you know. And it also means that we as a family now have got somewhere that we can visit. You know, we, we can go and visit this big, strong, ever-growing tree that we can sit under and, you know, talk to if we want to or whatever, you know, right by the lake. I just thought it was a beautiful idea. It's kind of like a, a living on, going back to nature and living on through this, this tree and this beautiful location. I, I really like the idea. It resonates with me. And it means that we have got a place that we can go, you know, that's personal to us, that um, you know, signifies my dad. So that was beautiful. And it was sun was shining. The whole family was there. It's really nice day. So yeah, I've done a few nice things this week, man. But guess what I was wearing when I was there? <laughs> you guessed it. And speaking of guests, let's bring on today's guest. You know, some people just make you feel like you're slacking. You know what I mean? Not content with being a successful comedian, a singer-songwriter, and also having a career that includes TV, radio, music journalism, and an award-winning podcast, today's guest also has to take up being an awesome author also. You see what I mean? Now, usually when I have a guest on to talk about their latest book, I like to have actually read the entire book. You know, I think it's the uh, respectful thing to do. Unfortunately, this, this came together quite quick and the hardback edition didn't arrive in enough time for me to actually tuck into it and read the whole thing. So I tried to, to delve into as, as much as I could to the digital copy. You know, I'm not great with Kindles and you know, reading a book on my phone. You know, I, I'm old school. I want to have the physical thing in my hands. You know? So uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to complete the whole book ahead of the uh, chat today, uh, much to my shame. So I hope today's guest will forgive me. But what I can tell you is from what I did read, I can't wait to finish the rest of this book. Equal parts funny, emotional, insightful, uplifting even, and damn fascinating actually and really interesting. Now the book in question is called The Breakup Monologues. And the tagline is The Unexpected Joy of Heartbreak. And God knows we've all had our fair share of that. So without further ado, I'm super excited to welcome onto the podcast today's guest, the funny, the clever, and the annoyingly multi-talented Rosie Wilby. Rosie, thanks for being with us. How are you doing? I'm okay, thank you. It's a little bit hot where I am, as it is perhaps for many people at the moment. <laughs> but yeah, I'm good. 
glad to hear it, man. Should we complain about the weather at this point? I mean, it is particularly hot, isn't it? And I'm one of those people that does complain about the weather, you know, <laughs> whatever we get. Yeah, I'm I'm okay with a bit of heat. Actually, I I can't enjoy it. So, I, yeah, I'm not I'm not really complaining. It's it's quite fun. I think the summer is quite a creative time. And I quite like being out and about and walking the dog, uh, maybe yeah. going to the beach and swimming in the sea. I, I enjoy all of those kind of summery activities. So I, I'm not complaining too much. I think for a, a comedian or writer or performer, it's quite a good time to be pacing around the park, kind of thinking up new ideas right. for comedy shows or books or just trying to perhaps learn a little piece of uh a piece of your set, piece of your performance that you want to get right. And and I just, I've always found being outdoors and being outside a bit more inspiring than just sitting at a desk at a computer. <laughs> and in fact, the right. first chapters of my first book were written outside in, in Brockwell Park, actually in, in Brixton in South London. It's a really beautiful park and they've got this walled garden where I sat and wrote the opening chapters out by hand and then we typed them up in the evening. Hmm, that's really interesting. Yeah, I'm always fascinated by other people's methods because I'm the exact opposite to that. You know, I'm very solitary. I need to be completely by myself, no distractions. You know, I can't do the whole coffee shop and outdoors in the park thing. And I really wish that I could. But it's just it's the only way I can work is to focus, you know, 100% just on the one thing with no distractions. And I really feel for my poor girlfriend that has to like live in the house with me whilst I'm working on anything because <laughs> I just go into my intense frowny zone. And I'm like that until the thing is finished, you know. But you're double interesting because you've got a creative legacy now in several different fields and you've you've been successful in several different fields. You know, as I mentioned on the intro, you know, that includes having a career initially as a singer songwriter and as a music journalist, you have been a personality on TV and radio. Um, Then you're what I would consider to be your main career now, which is um, as a comedian. Uh, As I said, you're a very successful podcast as well. And now an author. So there's quite a lot of stuff there. So would it be yeah. possible, you know, if you can give us the, the quick tour, the quick <laughs> Rosie Wilby 101, just to bring the listeners who don't yet know you up to date? Yeah, well, I was, as you say, I was making music uh, in, back in the 1990s. I was also a music journalist um, at Time Out magazine, which has sadly just stopped printing. They printed their final ever issue. They still exist online, but... I was very much um, in my sort of early 20s involved in the kind of Britpop scene around North London and was either writing about bands or was playing with my own bands. And we were not, you know, (laughs) huge stars, but we um, supported lots of interesting bands and rubbed shoulders with some interesting people. And I had my own album out on my own label, which was out in in all the shops and and I played some festivals and it you know it was fun times it was it was good fun and I guess that's where I began my creative journey and got interested in performing and expressing things telling stories on stage whether that's at through song initially but then I started to tell stories between the songs sort of quite self-deprecating and sometimes inadvertently funny stories, particularly when the band had broken up and I was doing solo gigs and I sort of wanted to make some kind of (laughs) sense of there being more value to the gig. I felt a bit unconfident as a solo acoustic performer without the noise of a band around me. Mm, So I somehow thought if I was funny between songs, it added something, an extra dimension for the audience. So yeah, then people started saying, well, why don't you have a go at stand-up comedy? And I did. I entered a few competitions. This is now in the sort of mid noughties And I, yeah, found myself in the finals of a few competitions, things like uh, Funny Women, which is a competition to find the best new female talent every year. And also in the latter stages of um, some quite prestigious competitions called So You Think You're Funny. One of them is called Amused Moose. <laughs> which is quite a weird title. There's there's lots of sort of strange, funny animal themes because there's laughing horse as well. (laughs) And so I I found myself in the latter stages of all these competitions. And then I guess, you know, you start getting promoters invite you to do gigs and you start making friends with lots of other comedians and you start becoming involved in the London comedy circuit. And then obviously gigging outside of London and around the UK and a little bit internationally around around the world as well but I think where my body of work if that's not too (laughs) 
too uh, pretentious a term that, <laughs> that people might know me for now. Where that all started was I began um, a trilogy of shows that I took to Edinburgh Fringe and toured around uh, all about the psychology of love and relationships, which has been quite a fertile and interesting area for me because I just think how we work when we're in love is so fascinating. There's a yeah. lot of real science and psychology as to how that works and how complex human relationships are when you look at how the brain works and how our basic sort of wiring and evolution works and how that doesn't necessarily seem that compatible with the sort of fast-paced modern life that we lead with dating apps kind of reminding us how many romantic options we might have out there. <laughs> um, it's very hard for us to sort of stick with, with one partner. So I was kind of really interested in the sort of the tension in a way between this new dating landscape and, you know, our, I guess, idealized romantic fairy tales about what we think we want and how we think we just want one person forever and how actually that's that's quite difficult to to find and to maintain and navigate and the sort of work that goes into maintaining a relationship. So the first part of this trilogy was called The Science of Sex, which was a sort of spoofy sex education lesson, uh, the kind we all wish we'd had at school, where, you know, we talked about things like different sexualities and sexual identities and orientations because I'm a gay woman and I suppose I always felt when I had sex education at school that it was assumed that everyone was, yeah. was heterosexual yeah. and, you know, that there was a whole erasure of a whole variety of different stories that fall outside of the narratives that we see in sort of mainstream films and hear about in love songs and so on. So I was very interested to represent, you know, those other stories that fall outside of that. And to be honest, we probably all do really because none of us have had, you know, the perfect oh gosh, I met this person and they were definitely the one and I was absolutely certain and then we got married and we stayed together yeah, yeah, forever yeah. and ever. Well, a few people have got that, but <laughs> loads of people have got much more complex stories and, you know, roller coaster love lives and rocky patches and difficult challenges. And, you know, even if you do stay with one person, it's not always easy. We argue, you know, human beings don't always get on and we certainly weren't you know, we weren't evolved to actually stay with one person as long as we as we now live as human beings. So the second part of this trilogy was called Is Monogamy Dead? And I was looking at those complex questions that we, you know, have to navigate and think about if we are going to maintain and stay in a long term relationship. And I did an online survey asking what counts as cheating, because we assume that we know, we assume, oh, if you have sex with somebody else, that's that's cheating, that's an affair, right? But I think it's way more nuanced than that because for some people it turns out, certainly from the, the answers that they put down on my survey, it turns out that for some people kissing might count as cheating or staying up all night talking to somebody and sharing your most intimate, innermost secrets with somebody. Or for some people they might be okay with their partner having sex with somebody else or having some kind of intimacy with somebody else, but they might not feel comfortable with them falling in love with yeah. somebody else and having that deeper emotional connection and intimacy. So actually it's a very personal thing to talk about exclusivity and fidelity in a relationship. And these are really complex questions. And so when I was initially looking into this for the purposes of a comedy show, um, I really found that there was a lot of stuff you could get into and dig into a lot deeper. And so I have found myself writing more serious articles for newspapers and magazines and doing a TEDx talk, doing a um, Radio 4 false thought piece and, yeah, doing a lot of slightly more serious talks and events where you can go from the sort of fun part of it, like, oh, gosh, you know, let's, let's have a few jokes just to ease into this topic because we may not all be comfortable about talking about it, but then actually get a little bit deeper about what we want and need in our human relationships and how we can communicate better around that. And I even found myself putting myself way out of my comfort zone and doing things for for research, like uh, performing comedy at a sex party, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which was a fun experience. And I think the 
the sort of ethics and the rules that you had to sign up to on going into that sex party were really interesting because it was all about a sense of accountability and watching out for one another and respecting one another and respecting other people's boundaries. And so I actually thought they were pretty good takeaways for really all of our relationships, even if we're not going to go and have sex with other people. (laughs) That's interesting. At a a full-on sex party. But I just thought if you are somebody who has opened up your relationship if you and your long-term partner have said you know we we're gonna maybe have sex or some kind of intimacy with other people you really have to communicate at quite a deep and and emotional and mature level to be able to agree how you do that and so I just felt there was a lot of really good communication going on in the sort of the world of polyamory as we call it that's that's interesting monogamy the monogamy is sort of monos gamos, one marriage for life. It comes from the Greek. Yeah. Although I say that we do tend to now mean one ma- marriage at a time. Because <laughs> <laughs> many of us are serially yeah. monogamous. As I say, we're now living much longer lives. So, you know, maybe it's hard to stay with one person, you know, for decades and decades. Because yeah. we, we evolve as human beings. Sometimes we grow apart. I don't think we should feel a sense of failure or shame always when a partnership does end. Um, and so, yeah, I think sort of immersing myself in, in that kind of world where people were having relationships in ways that, you know, I hadn't really heard much about because it, it was certainly a few years ago seen as a bit of a taboo. Mm. Um, certainly here in, in this country and in our sort of, you know, in our Western world, um, we, we kind of really put monogamy and the idea of fidelity on, on a pedestal. And we, we tend to disapprove of affairs and people cheating but you know there are plenty of people ethically and consensually negotiating a different different way of having a relationship a more open way of having a relationship and I just find that mind-blowing because I'd been so entrenched in this sort of monogamous culture I guess um you know and I don't think where where you are on the sexuality spectrum necessarily influences that because I think even if you know, you're gay and you come out, still the messaging is about finding the yeah, one yeah, in yeah. inverted commas rather than more than one. Um, so, yeah, and I just found people kind of devising new language for how we have relationships, which was really exciting as well. Um, so in the world of polyamory, if you feel you've reached your threshold of partners, you can say that you're polysaturated, <laughs> <laughs> which I, I quite like that one. <laughs> so, yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah. So that was fun. And then, um, so I, I enjoyed, um, you know, all the real deep thinking I had to do whilst writing and touring that show. And it seemed only right to end a trilogy about love and relationships with a show or about breakups. And that's when I started thinking about breakups and writing and speaking and performing about breakups a lot of the time. And so now I've sort of unofficially been crowned the queen of breakups. (laughs) Last time I was on Radio 4, (laughs) Uh, they called me the queen of breakups. And um, so... I guess the the show I did about my own breakup story initially was inspired by the time I got dumped by email. <laughs> and I, you know, I have joked that I uh, I felt much better once I corrected her spelling. Yeah. <laughs> but, I, I heard you changed the font as well, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I, I changed <laughs> the font. Felt much better then. Wingdings is uh, better. But, um, yeah, I think actually being dumped is you know, a real shock and it's such a big life change for us that, you know, it's a really bewildering thing. And I wanted to explore how we recover from heartbreak and how other people had recovered from it. And so my solo show then ended up morphing into a chat show with other artists, performers, writers, and we started recording that for the podcast, which um, there's now uh, kind of, yeah, we're into our fifth season. So there's wow. about 60 episodes online that people can listen to. So I'd love people to go and check that out. We've had some incredible comedians on um, from Richard Herring, um, Chappie Call Sandy, Cindy V, loads of fantastic people, Katie Brand, two um, people, writers, and people like Dolly Alderton has been on as well. So, uh, yeah, it's been really 
um, really exciting to to tour the podcast. We mostly record live at festivals and events, so it does mean there's, <laughs> there's a really fun atmosphere when the audience are all uh, getting into uh, – you know, cheering if they yeah. had a breakup that they right. want to sort of somehow oh, let out that angsty feeling yeah. about. <laughs> um, and amazing. then, of course, I decided to turn it into a book, which is, I guess, one of the main reasons we're talking now, because um, I would absolutely love people to, to check out the book, which combines some of the science that I've been investigating and researching and, and talking to academic experts about with my own story and with some of the, my very favorite stories that I've heard on the podcast. That is super interesting, man. What interest in life you've had so far. And I think it's awesome that you've chosen this subject to delve into as well, because, you know, breakups are universal. You know, we've, we've all got our famous breakup stories, you know what I mean? But what's interesting in listening to you talk there is how many other corridors it opens up and how many other questions it opens up. I mean, I'm sure there must be tons of crossovers um, between studying relationship issues and breakups, which lead you into other subjects of, you know, or or lessons learned perhaps in the areas of self-discovery and, you know, human nature, psychology, the human condition, you know, the life experience. You know, I just imagine that this could probably be an endless (laughs) line of study, you know, as you just keep going deeper into different areas. I mean, do you personally feel like you've completed this particular line of inquiry now or does it just open up more questions? And or do you think that it is actually, you know, it could actually be an endless pursuit? (laughs) Well, it probably could be endless, couldn't it? There's certainly still questions I have. And I think what's been interesting is to sort of put myself right at the centre of my research. I am sort of my own, um, you know, science experiment in a way. I'm sort of trying to improve my own life and my own relationships by learning more about how relationships work and then documenting, (laughs) documenting that. And so, to some extent, it feels like it's reached an interesting point because I have recently got married. I know. Congratulations. I was going to save that till later on, but uh, oh. <laughs> it's out there. <laughs> I put it out there. And so <laughs> I guess the book, although it's called The Breakup Monologues, it's quite interesting. A lot of people in relationships have said, oh, well, it's not for me, is it? Um, and then when they have read it, they've been like, oh, my goodness, it, I, it was so interesting. And I learned so much about you know, thinking about maintaining my relationship and how to, you know, how to still celebrate my own individuality within that relationship. And so really the book is all about navigating, staying together, having learned from your past relationships, and right. your past breakups, because it documents my relationship with girlfriend, as she's called in a bit. She's now my wife. And so, yeah, it really is about how we grow and we heal and how to some extent, I think our breakups are ultimately transformative and quite positive experiences because they help us to identify what we don't want and therefore right. what we do want as well. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I think we become better at communicating in relationships, communicating our needs and communicating our boundaries and just understanding ourselves because a breakup, painful as it is, forces some very necessary self-reflection. Mm, yeah, for me, that opens up a whole other conversation about, you know, the merits of hardship and the lessons that we learn through trauma or heartbreak or, you know, hardship of any kind. But before we go there, I'm just curious to find out that now that you have dropped the bombshell that you are indeed married, I'm just curious to know what that means now, you know, for the queen of the breakup. I mean, have you now deprived <laughs> yourself of the field work that you need in order to continue this study? It's a, it's a conundrum, isn't it? It's yeah. like... But I'm very honest in the book about the arguments that we have, about the challenges we have, about being two women in a relationship, which is is interesting because women obviously have these hormonal cycles Mm. that can influence our moods. (laughs) So if you've both got that going on, that can be interesting. Um, So, you know, I I do think, um, you know, I'm not sure. There's different avenues I really, really want to explore. Um, but, you know, at some point I may even write how to stay married, you know, and how, do you, <laughs> how, do you, how the heck do you navigate that? Because it's, it's still, I don't think there's a real happy ending. Like, I don't think it's as binary as going, oh, I got married. I mean, it yes. is lovely. Yeah. And at the moment, that's that's been very celebratory, of course. Although, I have to say, about a week after we got married, we both got COVID, oh, shit. <laughs> which, which was a bit of a bummer. Um, so so our, our 
real exuberant joy was, was slightly dampened by, right. by feeling lousy for a week or two. Um, but yeah, um, that, that's all very joyful. But I don't really believe that getting married is the be all and end all and the sort of happy ending. Um, because I think being single can be somebody's happy ending as well. Yeah, if they're yeah. getting out of a relationship that just was right for them, it was draining them of all their energy and positivity, mm. and they go and start a new adventure and a new career or have, you know, amazing friendships or do other stuff that really fulfills them. Um, you know, it isn't necessarily all about being in a relationship. We really make it all about that in the way we talk about love and talk about relationships but there are all kinds of different love mm. that we experience and in fact one of the chapters that people have responded to the most in the book is there's one about friendship breakups and how important our friendships are and how painful that is when they break up and how we don't always even recognize that as the same kind of loss so without giving too much away from the book then because ultimately we want everybody listening to rush out right now and go and buy a copy of the book <laughs> But what would you say would be like the one main takeaway if we were going to give something away to the listeners from all of the different types of relationships that you've studied and looked at and, you know, as well as being, you know, going to crazy sex parties and things like that, <laughs> you know, as, and, and, you know, your own experience of relationships and breakups. What would you say if there, would, if there was one universal commonality between why people break up and or how they stay together? What would the what would that takeaway be? Well, I do think, you know, kind of naff as it is, communication right. is, is key. And like I say, I learned so much <laughs> at that sex class, even though I was I was just sort of infiltrating the event just to uh, do, do comedy at the little cabaret event that happens before the, the, the main event starts. Um, and But I, I just sort of felt discussion of boundaries and consent and these these issues and you know an openness around what turns us on what what sex is <laughs> you know it's just so so healthy because i do think in in this country in in britain you know we can be a bit um uh, you know, a bit reserved. ashamed. A yeah, bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, a bit sort of, oh, you know, it's all innuendo, isn't it? Right. Um, you know, <laughs> that, that sort of kind of slightly camp carry on kind of style <laughs> of humour where we're like, oh, yeah, always oh, had a bit of the other. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. And if we don't, it's just so many euphemisms. We, we don't want to say, you know, or they, they've just had sex, you know. Oh, you know, that's that. Didn't they have? And lovely fun time. Yeah. Um, you know, um, we, we just sort of feel a bit, a bit awkward about sex. And so I think an openness about that and about love and about what that means is, is just very, very healthy. And I just think we need to become better at communicating around that. So, so that's a real takeaway. But also I just think to change the narrative about success and failure, um, because I suppose as a comedian, I've really embraced the idea of failure because you have to, because as a comedian, even if you're pretty experienced and you typically make audiences laugh, <laughs> um, you might still have a bad gig. Sometimes mm. it's just weird. Sometimes the audience just aren't on your wavelength or maybe the gig is not set up very well or, right. they, you know, the microphone doesn't work or they can't really hear you or the lighting doesn't work and they can't see you or it's just a really weird room, you know, with a really high ceiling and the, the laughter evaporates and the right. energy is somehow sucked out of the space. So sometimes it's just a bit weird and you feel like you're absolutely dying on stage. But those are the gigs you kind of learn the most from. And I, I would say in the same way, those are the those failures in inverted commas are the life experiences that we learn the most from. And so I, I do think breakups are really, really valuable in that sense, or adversity in in a broader sense. Yes, you know, I talk agreed. about professional breakups as well. And you know, if a, a job or a career ends, um, you know, how we learn learn from that more what we want to do, what decisions we might make differently, what things we might do differently so yeah definitely I do think yeah 100%. That, that adversity can can be good so we have to change that idea that you know success is just sort of 
staying in a relationship forever and ever, yeah. even if you're not that happy. You know, yeah. we celebrate uh, wedding anniversaries with these kind of ascending hierarchies of gifts, don't we? That, you know, it starts off like just sort of wood and paper or whatever. <laughs> and then, you know, when you've been together for years and years, it's gold and diamonds yeah. and ruby. Whereas actually, if you were together for a few years, but you really consciously and respectfully said, actually, it's not working anymore, maybe that would be a real success because you've communicated really, yeah. really well. And if you've done that kindly and respectfully, maybe that's maybe that's a good thing. So, yeah, I think we need to change that narrative. And also to embrace the fact that endings can also be beginnings because right. I've done this thing in the book where I've written – the first half of the book in a sort of backwards timeline and the second half of the book in a forwards timeline. So it's a bit like one of those butterfly paintings that you paint as a child and there's yeah. actually a, pi a picture of a butterfly, an illustration of a butterfly to sort of give this sense in the book. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when you were a kid and you sort of used to paint on one side of the paper and then kind of fold it in half and smoosh the paint together, you'd get in theory, a sort of slightly symmetrical image, but maybe it wouldn't be completely symmetrical. It'd be a bit off depending on the distribution of the paint. So I wanted this sense that, you know, when we look back and when we look forward, we can see slightly different pictures of, of the same thing, of the Love same it. period yeah, of yeah. time. Such a good idea. Perfectly illustrates the point as well, doesn't it? Like you said, of like, you know, it's, it's that age old thing of like, you know, one door closes, another one opens. Yeah. And um, yeah, learning from adversity, it's those, it's those times of hardship and struggle that we learn more about ourselves and, and that we have to tap in or channel some kind of inner in a something that we didn't know we had perhaps or that we can learn from it um as the as the queen of breakups then and as somebody that has had your fair share of breakups okay. um who would you say is on your greatest hits of personal breakups who would you say is your number one then who is your um who is your bohemian rhapsody of of <laughs> rosy <Rosie> Welby <laughs> breakup experiences <laughs> oh dear well i mean i do talk a lot about being dumped by email because I, I think that's uh, culturally interesting because now we've moved on to a phase where we seem to think being dumped by text or email is probably fine and in fact might be quite quaint and polite because what many people do now is is just ghost somebody and I have a chapter decoding mm. the new lexicon of breakups you know what do all these phrases like ghosting and breadcrumbing and submarining all mean <laughs> there's this whole new world all these new words um my favorite one actually is marleying where you do ghost someone but you pop up again at Christmas huh yeah, I know. It's mad, isn't it? Um, pop up for your Christmas fling. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I, I do think that that breakup has been really interesting to me because it, it hit hard because uh, it felt really abrupt um, 10 years ago to be dumped by email. But mm. maybe now that would be more than norm, yeah. um, which I don't know if that's a really good reflection of society <laughs> or not. Um but yeah, I, I have also talked in the book about my breakup with boozy ex-girlfriend, she's called, um, although she's actually <laughs> not not a big drinker anymore, I would like to add. But at the time we were together, when we were in our 20s, and it was the 1990s, we had we had a you know a bit of a party lifestyle and we we had a few drinks often on nights out. And that was when I was gigging with the band and she used to sing backing vocals with the band. Right. And so, you know, we 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 used to have a few drinks. Um, but she especially enjoyed a few drinks. <laughs> and um, yeah, I do sort of again joke in inverted commas about the time that she uh, burnt our flat down. <laughs> um wow. yeah. Uh, yeah, so so, um, but we we remained friends, and actually, we got our deposit back from our landlord. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> they just wanted to get you out of there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think he felt bad because the main reason that the fire had been so bad was because his of his highly flammable cheap furniture that he uh, furnished the flat with. Right. Yes. So, um, yeah, and it, there was some sort of dark humour in in that. It was a difficult time, really, because obviously we. I had to find somewhere to live and ultimately we ended up breaking up soon after that summer. Um, and um, yeah, we, uh, all our friends sort of looked down the back of their wardrobes for old clothes that we could borrow and stuff because all our clothes were all stinking and, right. and stained and everything. Yeah. And uh, my friend gave me this bag of, of clothes and weirdly her brown uniform was in there. <laughs> 
Hmm. Like I was going to wear that. I thought that was quite strange. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm small, but yeah. I'm not even going to ask. I was thinking this. Shall I ask? No, I'm not. Gonna, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I didn't get it out. Didn't get it out for any sex games. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you never know. I just assumed it might have been part of your research or something like that. You know. <laughs> I mean, you know, we don't judge on this show. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> No. So in your travels and your research for this book then, I mean, we've spoken about, you know, the, the British culture and how reserved we are, you know, with regards to, you know, sex in particular. Have you, are you aware of any cultures around the world where they're a bit more mature on these issues or a bit more open with, you know, um, matters of the body, sex, relationships, breakups, different types of relationships and marriages, etc. You know, is it anywhere that stands as an example of where it's being done a bit better? Well, it's really interesting. I mean, you certainly see some European countries where affairs are more accepted as as part of the norm. And you often actually see lower divorce statistics in those countries. Um, But then equally, you know, you do see some countries where you know, the divorce rate is really, really low, but you kind of think, well, hang on, what's what's going on there? Mm. Um, and, and sometimes there's a lot of kind of shame around divorce and, and affairs are going on, you know, kind of um, a, a lot, you know, or, or actually maybe affairs are going on for men, but, but women culturally don't have the same freedoms. Yeah. So, you know, that there's sort of, you know, you can make different, you can argue different cases. You can kind of say, well, maybe sort of a, a kind of healthy attitude to affairs is, is to just sort of turn a blind eye sometimes. Right. But but actually it depends who, you know, who's having the affairs and what's the sort of power dynamic in all these relationships. What's the cultural norm in, in that society? Um, and yeah, you do see some parts of the world where there's a completely different attitude to monogamy and, and sort of exclusive relationships. And there are apparently 18 Amazonian tribes that believe in the idea of partable paternity, which means that they believe that a child has multiple fathers. Right. And it's, it's a good thing for the woman to have sex with lots of different men and the sperm sort of all mixes together. Wow. Now, that's not like factually or scientifically correct as, no. as far as we know. <laughs> um, but it's an interesting idea because certainly – you know, in an evolutionary sense in the animal world, um, it has been said that females take a long time to climax because they are supposed to have sex with lots of different males in the same right. session so that the strongest sperm of the, the strongest male actually is is the one that, right. that you know, fertilizes the egg. So, yeah, so, so it is really interesting. And I do think that societally – you know, in this Western world, we have done a lot to limit female sexuality hmm. and to put myths around that. And that's why I was really interested. There's an early chapter in my book where I talk about going to participate in a sex lab experiment where you are looking at erotica and having your sort of arousal measured. You're kind of wired up to the computers and so that is a it's <laughs> quite a fun chapter, quite a fun <laughs> experiment that I took a part took part in. But what's, what really tickled me was between the clips of erotic images that they're showing you, the control clip to calm you down is a David Attenborough nature documentary. <laughs> wow! Yeah, I would just find that damn interesting. Yeah, I can think of way quicker <laughs> ways to turn people off. Than I know. That. You know. I'm thinking immediately. I'm thinking of uh, image images of Margaret Thatcher just popped into my oh, head for some God. reason. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But you know, whatever gets you off, man. I mean, there were probably, you know, many Tory boys that would probably totally get off on that. Hell yeah, no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so bringing it back to the culture that we're both most familiar with then, you know, in this case, Britain. Do you see us moving in a more progressive direction? I personally feel that we are. You know, maybe not as fast as they are in Scandinavia, for example, but, you know, even in the land of the stiff upper lip, I do generally see uh, us becoming more open and progressive and mature on these issues. You know, is that what you're seeing? Do you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. Because um, when I first did my comedy show with this title, Is Monogamy Dead?, which became my first book and a TEDx talk and, um, and that kind of thing, yeah, I found that people were quite nervous about taking flyers for that show. They were like, well, what's that, what's that about? Mm. And it actually had the What Counts Cheating survey on the back of the flyer, which some people filled in. Um, and 
yeah i mean it it was it was great to do that show at that time and sort of have that slight tension where some people were coming along and with the presumption that they were going to be a bit annoyed or shocked or and actually finding that i'm largely speaking a monogamous person who was just really interested in questioning all this stuff yeah um and and wanted to sort of liberate myself a bit from the restrictive narratives that we do have in place around female sexuality as, as I've just sort of talked about a little bit so um yeah I think that was really interesting how how some people were a bit frosty around the idea of that show because there was an assumption that I was you know a hedonistic polyamorous person having sex with you know 10 different partners right. i mean even if i was i don't think that's necessarily wrong if everyone knows what's going on yeah. personally i don't think i have the time and energy <laughs> <laughs> um you've got to you've got to be very organized with your diary lots oh, of God. Coded pages i can't imagine um, i can't imagine <laughs> all the people I, I interviewed who were polyamorous were you know, I'd say, when have you got free? And they'd be like, oh, hang on, check my diary. Oh, I think I've got an afternoon in September. You know, it'd be wow. months ahead. <laughs> Full-time job, man. No, one is enough for so, me, man. Jesus. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> I think relationships are complicated enough. But absolutely fair play to people who navigate that emotionally, honestly, and respectfully, and consensually, and consciously. Um, you know, I think that can be uh, an incredibly fulfilling and healthy way of going about relationships if, if you so if you so choose. And I think it does inspire these different types of conversations about the value, success, and failure of um, of relationships. So, yeah, I think it's um, it's really exciting. But yeah, I think I've seen people's attitudes shift when I talk about. The fact I've, you know, my first book was called Is Monogamy Dead? And people are like, oh, that's really interesting. You know, how, how what inspired that? How did how did that go? What's your answer to the question? What do you think? And people are much more up for a conversation around that whole title and question and topic now. And, you know, in the breakup monologues, the new book, there is a chapter about polyamorous breakups and how, you know, it's slightly different if you break up but you then still have another relationship that's ongoing, mm. you know, and how do you sort of put your time and energy into that when you also want to just go away and hide and cry and grieve yeah, the relationship yeah, yeah. that has ended? Um, yeah, so that's an interesting situation and dynamic. And, yeah, so I really wanted to pull that kind of little bit of, of research about polyamory into the new book about breakups as well and, and reflect some kind of different experiences as well as the sort of very typical um you know breakups after after a, a long marriage or, yeah. or monogamous relationship that that my, must most of us will be more familiar with i find it really interesting that you know what looks on the surface of it to be a book about you know breakups and you know, navigating breakups and what we can learn from breakups uh, actually it's interesting how broad this is and how many other areas it this this conversation opens up and leads into well i was going to say one other little area that people might be interested to know that comes up in the book is a little bit about the future of breakups and whether in the not too distant future we might be able to take a pill to help us forget an ex so a bit uh, like the film eternal sunshine of the spotless mind which is one of my favorite films wow is that is that something that's actually a thing is it in tests and trials does it exist or is it merely a you know an idea at this point there are there are re researchers looking into this there's a neuroethicist that i know called brian Earp, and he is looking into how we could harness the side effects of certain drugs that we actually already commonly take, um, things like antidepressants in the SSRI family. And um, a lot of these have side effects of slightly emotionally distancing us um, from people. So say if you were in an abusive relationship, a controlling relationship that you wanted to be able to distance yourself from, um, you might uh, find that a drug that allowed you to do that helped you to leave a relationship without mm. feeling that terrible sense of, oh, but they're the one, I, I, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I need to stay with them, I need to be with them. So it's really interesting. Brian talks about how we really are only using these drugs for a specific purpose because that's how they're being marketed at the moment, but we're not really thinking about 
all the other side effects that actually you could harness for different different uses and also drugs that you know now currently are illegal but maybe have previously been used in couples counseling and so on drugs like mdma which have been or could be used to perhaps help us navigate staying together or communicating in a mm. in a therapy session communicating better yeah, that's really interesting i didn't know about any of that i mean the future does hold some crazy and scary things you know and after speaking with you today now I, I, i'm getting an insight into just what a massive market this could be when technology or medicine such as that exists because you know as we become more hybridized i can totally see a world in which you know perhaps it could be an app or something that would monitor your emotion levels or your chemical imbalances and adjust those somehow in real time you know mm. I mean, I don't know if that is useful or terrifying. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. I think the sort of ethics of it is really, you know, it's something we need to think about quite carefully because Definitely. maybe you do away with the sort of really positive growth and learning and healing. Good point. Yeah, that I've been talking about. You True. know, if. Um, you could just sort of take a pill and that would help you forget your ex. <laughs> you know, Shut if it, it was down, that yeah, simple. right. Then maybe you would just sort of repeat old patterns. I think that's what a lot of psychotherapists would say. And in fact, in the film, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, the two characters do actually meet and get together again without realizing right. that they met and had a relationship before. So I think that's indicative of how we would perhaps be drawn to the same patterns if we couldn't remember. So remembering is useful, but remembering perhaps with less trauma attached might be the way to go so there are ways that that uh, that we can recall memories perhaps whilst taking a particular drug or substance that that we might be able to reduce the trauma attached so so there's a lot of research being done into into this whole area that's a very interesting point yeah and it ties back perfectly to what you said earlier about depriving yourself then of the learning experience that you can get from that and the growth experience and the, and the strength that you can develop as a result of these experiences it you know you, you you lose the positive aspect of it then yeah i think so but it's hey it's it's an interesting discussion to have isn't it it's all food for thought yeah because yeah our relationships are are fascinating complex things and um the, yeah there's a whole lot of science and psychology to what is happening and i guess for me the reason i've as a comedian found it really rewarding to explore this area is because I've been able to make it very personal and accessible. And I get people coming up to me at shows and saying, oh, you know, I look, I brought my ex along tonight. We're friends again because of right. your podcast and because of your book and because, you know, I lent my book to her and <laughs> and then we decided we better start talking again and, and we could communicate about That's what awesome. happened in our breakup and That's relationship. Awesome. Yeah. And, yeah, so on the on the occasions when that has happened, that's really that's really amazing. And I I think, you know, obviously some people might go away and then read some of the drier scientific academic texts, but I think a lot of these people probably wouldn't have really got into how the psychology of it worked, you know, it initially by going to sort of reach for a very dry and, and dusty yeah. sort of very academic e book. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I hope that my book is a good starting point for people starting to understand a bit of what is, is going on and how when we, you know, when we actually are breaking up with someone, we're effectively going through a, a sort of withdrawal process. A right. bit like when we are, you know, withdrawing from an, a drug. Well, comedy is such a brilliant communicator as well, isn't it? You know, the ability to make somebody laugh and then perhaps open them up to ideas or information or taboos that they may not have previously been comfortable entertaining. I think you know, comedy is such a unique form of communication in that, in that regard. Yeah, I hope so. I, th I think so, because it, it just makes us feel a little bit more at ease if we can laugh and we can share experiences and go oh my god that happened to me too oh my god i, I did that too oh yeah, i got yeah. done by email and, and i felt you know like you did i felt really angry and, and annoyed and um yeah I, I wanted to have some comeback to that i wanted to be able to debate it and, and understand why you know why this person was breaking up with me and um so so yeah i do think that yeah it, it helps us to feel less alone and and more like 
we're part of a community um, and that's what the atmosphere I like to generate at the Breakout Monologues shows. Well, I was listening to Catherine Ryan's podcast, which which I really enjoy as well. I, I find her hilarious. And she was talking on one of the episodes about the power that comedy has to help you through you know, the difficulties of life in general, you know, the ability to laugh at yourself as well and not take yourself too seriously or to laugh at your um, adversity, to find the humor in it has actually helped her through a lot of intensely difficult times in her life, you know, with illness or mental health or breakups or whatever it may have been. So not only is it a great communicator, it's also incredibly powerful to help you through the difficulties of life, you know, the inevitable uncertainties of life, the ups and downs and the challenges that we all face, you know, comedy and the ability to laugh at it all is a very powerful tool to have. And I totally agree. I'm a big comedy fan and it's helped me through so many things in life. So, so it's a very powerful gift that you've got. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's been a really interesting ride doing doing comedy for the last kind of I don't know 10 15 years and I suppose in some ways I'm moving into a slightly more hybrid career now where right I'm kind of writing and speaking more seriously as well as still doing stand-up gigs where it is all out kind of fun and stand-up um but yeah I I don't know we shall see where it all goes and possibly another avenue I'm going to be exploring is um Again, on the sort of broad tapestry of relationships, but no more our kind of sibling relationships and family connections. And I've been interested in the fact that I'm an only child right. and not having siblings has definitely been something that has, yeah, definitely caused me some sense of loneliness in the world. That's interesting. I think. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm possibly going to be delving deeper into that mm. because I did record a podcast pilot, a sort of feature length podcast pilot that people can hear on the breakup monologues feed, which was called looking for my sister. And I got a bit into the ideas around, um, well, some people without knowing it are womb twin survivors. So they might have had a, a twin in the womb that, that died and, I guess sort of my generation maybe wouldn't even necessarily know because women probably had less scans and less checkups yeah. than than they might do now. So yeah, I kind of I I I don't know whether I'm I I had a, another twin in the womb certainly not to my knowledge, but I'm I'm interested in maybe digging further into that because I've always had this sort of notion or idea that maybe I had a sister, but it may be just something I've invented just to feel less lonely as a kid. Right, right. Um, but I am quite interested in delving into that. So you never know; that could be another project. I think that is a brilliant idea because i'm a middle child of three um so i, ah. I, so I can tell you it's a pain in the ass <laughs> <laughs> oh well you see we always want what we don't have yeah you know? yeah well i think it's, it's very similar to relationships i think because i think both have a different set of problems and strengths and, and pros and cons you know like everybody i know you know has baggage from their sibling relationships you know whether they feel like the other one was the favorite one or they you know they've always felt yeah. under the shadow of their bigger brother or whatever it might be so i think that would be a very interesting subject for you to jump into especially from your perspective as an only child yeah so we, we'll see i definitely want to delve into that more it was really interesting to uh, to record this podcast pilot i got a, a small commission um small grant to do that so yeah what is the space um i'd like to develop that idea a little bit more but yeah in the meantime i'll still be touring the breakup monologues podcast and recording live episodes at festivals and around and about and yeah um still doing talks about the book about the breakup monologues book because um uh, should be coming out in paperback next year, um, but it's at the moment available in hardback and Kindle and audiobook narrated by me, which oh, wow. is <laughs> an unusual experience sitting there. You just feel like you're just sitting there forever, just reading your own words in right. a little cupboard. It's yes. weird. <laughs> yeah, I did the same with mine and I realised how bad I am at reading <laughs> and, and how much I hate my voice. I was like, well, I, I can sing fine. Why can't I just talk? This should be easy. It's, it, I found it really, really difficult. I don't know about you. Yeah I, yeah, I think I really got into it. I was really enjoying the 
some of those latter chapters and probably enjoyed it right at the beginning, but I think I got really exhausted. There's the middle bit, I think, where I, I'm kind of quite quiet. It's really intimate. So I'm really leaning in close to the mic. So I'm just sort of, yeah, I'm quite tired. And I'm just sort of going to speak really softly. Right. <laughs> the tone sort of slightly changes, I think. Yeah. Right. Well, that's interesting, man. So, yeah, so even more reason to get the audio edition as well, because, you know, it's, it's read by yourself and uh, you're going you're yeah. to get all the emotion and everything that comes from your personal experience in there as well. So, yeah, I, I, I would just to finish up, I would definitely tell everybody that's been listening to this who is undoubtedly going to be fascinated by everything you said and want to know more and isn't going to need any nudging from me. But if you do... The Breakup Monologues is out now in hardback, available everywhere. Rush out, get a copy. It's on ebook, and um, as Rose just said, the the audio book edition is out as well. So, get a copy, steal a copy, borrow a copy, do whatever you got to do. But you're definitely yeah, going to want to read the book. Don't buy it. Don't steal it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I got to I got to keep it punk rock a little bit. You know. I tell you what, the one frustrating thing about my my first book, which a lot of people in the sort of polyamory world really enjoyed and were reading because it was looking into that whole thing about how we have relationships and how we perhaps monogamy we need to reinvestigate and stuff um but of course a load of the people in the poly community were in large relationship groups so they were all sharing the book mm. around a large group and i said no no you should all be buying a copy yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're giving me out a loads of royalties come on then <laughs> but um and the other thing i'd say about the hardback is um there's a beautiful um, illustration on the cover that just sort of suggests and hints at this idea of of symmetry that is yeah. just ever so slightly off between the two halves of the book. So, yeah. so you can see that on the cover of the book too. Yeah, the artwork is beautiful. I can't wait to get my heart back. I have uh, ordered it, like I said, it just hasn't arrived yet. So I would definitely recommend grabbing yourself a hard book copy whilst you can, because, you know, I, I'm old school. I prefer to have the book, like I said. Yeah, you know? I do. So The Breakup Monologues is out now. Rush out and grab a copy. It's available in all good bookstores, you know, when and where you can, please do support your local independence. But it is available absolutely everywhere, so you've got no excuse to not get yourself a copy right now. And where can people find you online so they can get in touch and tell you how much they love the book? Um, yeah, well, if you did enjoy the book, you can contact me um, on Twitter at Rosie Wilby and on Instagram at Breakup Monologues. That's the probably the main places. I mean, if you don't enjoy the book, then... Um, you may, you may not want <laughs> yeah. to get in touch. Uh, <laughs> well, you can get in touch with constructive criticism. Nah. Um, <laughs> it's funny, though. I mean, as a comedian, you always occasionally get people wanting to get in touch to say they didn't enjoy it. And uh. it's, it's weird how much effort the one person, as opposed to, like, you know, loads of people who send a short message saying, hey, love to set, or, right. you yeah. know, nice tweet or whatever. But the one person who didn't enjoy it, it's obviously taking a long time to compose a really long message about exactly the point <laughs> in your show that they they didn't agree they really with and hated. they didn't like. Yeah. And it's, it's really strange. And at, um, at some of my shows, I read out the protest letter that I got at uh, one of my book launches for the first book. A man had actually written out a, an actual letter and posted it through the letterbox of the door shop early, wow. uh, the bookshop, sorry, early that morning. Um, so that I would get the letter at my launch. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a lot of effort to uh, to get a point I don't, across. He hadn't even read the book. He was just offended by the title. What? But is monogamy dead? Not the breakup monologues, which yeah, is, yeah, yeah, yeah. is not that offensive. But the first that's book crazy, is monogamy isn't it? dead. It's, yeah, that's and he so thought, crazy. You know, he was one of these people who, like I said, some of the people who are a bit frosty about that title thought I shouldn't be questioning this precious construct of, of monogamy and you know I, he thought I was telling everybody to go and you know, have lots <laughs> of sex, sex party yeah, yeah, yeah. every five seconds <laughs> go to sex parties yeah which as I say it's totally fine um, as long as everyone is safe and consensual and knows what they're yeah, doing yeah, yeah. it's totally fine um, but it's interesting how there's that automatic assumption that that yes. if you're questioning monogamy that is your your message and that's what you're saying um so so yeah i do enjoy reading out his protest letter because uh, it is quite fun <laughs> well i love the fact that you've turned that again you know you turned that into a positive by now using it as material to laugh at you know <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah so i'd love to hear from people on on social media that's uh, probably the best way to get hold of me so that's at rosie will be on twitter and at breakup monologues on instagram do rush out immediately and grab yourself a hardback copy of the Breakup Monologues available everywhere now. Get them before they're all gone. 
And then get in touch with Rosie on her socials and let her know just how much you love the book. And unless you didn't, of course, you know, in which case, you know, just like, <laughs> just keep it to yourself. We don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I guess on that note, I suppose I should bid you farewell and give you the rest of your day back. Um, so thanks so much for giving us your time today. It's been great to meet you and to hear about your incredible career so far and, um, and hear more about this amazing book that you've written. I can't wait for my copy to arrive so I can devour it. And, um, you know, thanks for everything you've done, all the great content you've given us over the years and for keeping us laughing all this time. Best wishes with the book and best wishes with everything else that you've got coming up. And hopefully we'll speak again soon. Thank you. Cheers, Rosie. See ya. Bye, then. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Rosie will be. Let's hear it for her. Man, that was a fun chat. I had no idea that, uh, you know, uh, speaking about breakups and relationships was going to lead into so many different areas. So I'm even more excited now to get my hands on the book. I'm going to plug it one more time. It's called The Breakup Monologues by Rosie Wilby. It's available everywhere. The hardback edition is out now. So please do go out and grab copy. I hope you enjoyed the episode, and if you did, please do remember to subscribe to the podcast and leave a rating or a review if you like, and I will accept positive or negative comments because I don't care. As always, thanks for listening, thanks for all the support. I'll be back next week with another episode and another awesome guest, so stay tuned. In the meantime, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, love your loads, and stay awesome. See you next time.